If you've been watching this channel for the last couple of months, you'll know that we recently adopted a project car. We did a few live streams, but we never really gave you a tour. So today, that's exactly what I'm gonna do. Meet our currently unnamed Honda Insight electric project car. The Honda Insight is a particularly unusual looking car in terms of its shape and also in terms of its interior design, which I'll show you around in a minute. Originally, these cars had a three cylinder, one litre engine inside, producing I think about 67 horsepower. Don't quote me on that. And they were married to Honda's integrated motor assist or IMA system, which was essentially an electric motor in series with the petrol engine. And it allowed the car to go further using less petrol. Could you drive the IMA, the original IMA Insight in electric only mode? Well, sort of, kind of. And since then, people have modified original 2000, 2001, 2002, 2003 Insights to operate in an electric only mode. But this car was converted many years ago and it was converted by our good friend Otmar Ebenhook, who also was the guy responsible for the Zilla controller, which if you've been in the electric vehicle world for any length of time, you'll know about the Zilla controller. Otmar doesn't actually run that company anymore. He sold off the manufacturing to another company, but this car was converted by Otmar and some students in Corvallis in Oregon to electric using an EV1 motor and a prototype three-phase Zilla controller. What we're going to do with it is we're gonna change that a little bit. We're gonna take out the Zilla components. We're going to keep the EV1 motor and we're going to use the open inverter project to use a Chevrolet Volt power inverter. I've not explained it very well, but the open inverter project essentially allows people to take electric cars that have been scrapped or parted out and reuse their components in their own custom EV conversions. One of the leaders of that movement is, of course, Damien Maguire of the EV BMW fame, and he has done some amazing things with his cars. If you've been to Fully Charged Live in the UK, you may have met Damien and you may have met his fantastic BMW conversion with a Chademo port in the exhaust. Yeah, that guy. So let's have a look around and we'll see where this car is now and what we need to do with it. As you can see, the inside of this car is actually in a really great condition, despite having sat and not been run for, for more than five, seven years, in fact. The EV1 motor is, yes, the same motor that powered the EV1, the car that was crushed, the car that led to who killed the electric car, amongst obviously other cars as well. This was an original EV1 motor. I'm not sure of how it was obtained or how it was put in the car, I haven't asked Oakmar, but I do know that back at the turn of the century, you could actually buy motors for EV1s, either through cars that had been scrapped or through parts suppliers, because it was a production vehicle, a limited run production vehicle, and you could buy spares for it. So this is a genuine original EV1 motor. It's got the plate on it still. It says it's got a maximum power output of 103 kilowatts, it has 200 volts AC in, and it can take 400 amps. Now, there is another Honda Insight, believe it or not, in this same part of the United States with the same motor that is now a lot faster. And it's owned by John Wayland. Yeah, John Wayland of the white zombie fame. He has been working on his own Honda Insight conversion to try and make it run and be the car that the EV1 was never allowed to be because they were all taken in and crushed. And his car is now running and working. Hopefully when COVID's over, we'll be able to go and see John's car and maybe get some information and some inspiration for this project. Here is obviously where the engine used to be. This is the prototype controller from Oatmar and that original conversion project. And here is a brand new Optima yellow top battery that I put in a couple of weeks ago just to make sure that the central locking works, the air compressor works, which we'll come to in a second. 
And we've got this custom battery box and also mounting system for the controller right at the front of the vehicle. While it does still have its radiator, it doesn't have air conditioning anymore. The pipes are back here. And one of the things I'd love to do with this project is to get the air conditioning running again. But I've also been making a little list of all the things that are wrong with the car that need to be addressed. At the top of the list, and a really simple fix, I'm sure, is this catch mechanism. Now, the Honda Insight, the original Honda Insight, was 100% aluminium in terms of its body construction, or aluminium, if you prefer, if you live in America. And the aluminium frame does, you know, has changed over time, and I suspect it's probably gone through a few tweaks and tucks, which means that this catch no longer actually properly closes the bonnet. It goes to the first stage, but it doesn't go all the way down. And so that's going to be a weekend project for me. Inside the Insight, things are actually pretty stock. I can put my key in the ignition. I can turn it and all of the gauges and dials operate as they should. The noise you're hearing, if you are hearing a noise right now, is from the motor, the oil pump, that's on the EV1 motor, and that runs all the time. The car is powered. Inside, this car needs a thorough clean, and that's not Oatmar's fault, it's just that the Honda Insight is known for leaking, and I'll come to that in a second. It's kind of the next project on the list. When we picked up the car, there was a little bit of mould and dampness inside. We've wiped a lot of it down. Some of it still needs to be fixed. There's mould that needs to be treated on both of these overhead sun visors. And we also need to deep clean the seats and the carpet. Now, this is a manual, or at least it was when it left the factory. The Honda Insight was one of the few hybrids that was available as both an automatic and a manual transmission car. This one used to be a manual transmission. Obviously, the gears have been removed. There is now just one forward and one reverse gear. And something I'd love to do with this moving forwards is to maybe put a, a digital control mechanism in here instead of uh, the gear lever, just to have maybe a forward and reverse switch or just two push buttons. Whether I'll be able to make that happen or not, I don't know. The handbrake, the parking brake, emergency brake, whatever you want to call it, is just the same as it was originally. And everything else is the same, with two very important exceptions, at least in this part. There's lots of exceptions in the back. But here in the front, there are two little modifications. Number one, this car now has a, as Oatmar put it, a Wayland approved stereo system. John Wayland is not only known for making fast, electric cars. He also likes himself a decent sound system and apparently he had a part to play in putting in a really nice radio sound system in this car. I'm not going to turn it on because YouTube and copyright restrictions, but it's a really nice radio. I've had a listen to it. It's got a really good bass, a really good sound system, and that will be staying, I think, probably for now. I've known Oatmar and I've known John for a number of years. In fact, probably close to 10, 15 years now, I would guess. And this is definitely a John Wayland edition. The other addition that this car has is that it has an air compressor. It hasn't got the original springs that would have been in the stock Insight. Instead, it has an air compressor and you can pump up the air suspension to make sure that the Insight is riding nice and level when you've got all those batteries in the bag. Now, at the moment, there are no batteries in the back, so I can lower the rear of this car just by pushing this little button here, and the car will kneel down. If I press this button, it's kind of loud, but there's a compressor behind me, and that compressor pushes the suspension back up. Now, I wish I'd have known about this when we were putting it on the on the uh, trailer to bring it here. I knew about the compressor, but we couldn't get the car jump started. I didn't properly look at the way that everything was set up under the hood when we arrived. And we did try and jump start it, but ended up just making a short circuit and assumed something was wrong. But 
we only just got it on the transporter and it was just me and Erin. There was nobody else there. We were the only two. We had to push it on to the transporter with a suspension in its lowest possible setting. Kind of glad though, because had it been flat, it probably wouldn't have gone on at the front. So in terms of jobs for the interior, completely take out the interior and fix all of the little niggling issues. There is some galvanic corrosion in the seat mountings. That's because the seat mounting brackets are steel and the frame of the car is aluminium. And if you put aluminium and steel together and keep them together for long enough, you get what's called galvanic corrosion, which is a little bit like rust and that needs to be addressed. Otherwise the seats may not stay attached. So that is definitely a top priority that we need to fix. The Honda Insight came with side spats. This car was designed to be super aerodynamic. I can't remember the coefficient of drag off the top of my head. I think it's 0.24. Um, if I'm wrong, then maybe I can put something in the video to correct myself in post, as they say. But these cars came with wheel spats. This car had wheel spats when it arrived. I removed them because I wanted to check how the tyres were doing. All four tyres are going to have to be replaced. The rear ones especially have just stood for such a long time. They're starting to fall apart. They're not going to be safe on the road. Not that the car can go anywhere right now. I also want to basically restore the, the original wheels. They've got a few bits of curb rash from previous owners before Oatmar. And I just want to make sure that we clean all of that up and make sure that the brakes are also operating. These are drum brakes at the rear and discs at the front. The whole car is super lightweight. It's like it was originally 1800 pounds, which is extremely light for a car, especially in North America. Obviously this car was originally designed in Japan, Honda. It was sold all around the world. And I believe they used to call this the KE01 or Z1, something like that. I'll maybe find the original model number and put that on screen as well. Another cool thing I love about the Insight is that it originally used to have like a, a, an automatic release. You press the button and then you could lift the boot up. Unfortunately, that's not working. We'll add that to the list of things to fix. But if I find the right key on my monster key pile and I do it manually. You can see inside at the back where the batteries used to be. Now I've taken all of the stuff that was inside the car and put it in the garage. This included a lot of stuff from the original conversion. There are still some original things in the car from the original conversion and wiring that needs to be removed. But our plan is to build a battery pack using salvaged battery cells. I'm not sure if we're going to go with like salvaged Tesla cells or maybe, you know, build them um, like who does and maybe do like our own 18650 cell and like weld them together ourselves and put them in the rear of the car. Or whether we're just going to salvage something out of, say, a Chevy Volt or a Bolt or a Nissan Leaf and put those battery packs in there as well. There have been some modifications inside here, but originally this is where the IMA battery used to live. And there was also a place for you to put your luggage. The original Honda Insight had effectively a boot floor that was about this height that went all the way back. It, this was essentially the most fuel efficient car you could buy at the turn of the century. And even today, it is still one of the most fuel efficient hybrids that you can buy if you can find one for sale. They are still available. They do still work. There is a very loyal community that follows and repairs and loves these cars and keeps them going. And I'm going to be relying on them, the Insight Central people, to keep this car running, even though we're going to convert it to electric. I've already talked to the fantastic Peter Perkins, who, again, I have known for, oh, 15 plus years about some of the mods that we need to do to the dashboard display to get it to show regenerative braking. He thinks that's all possible. Pete Perkins has been responsible for all kinds of great mods for this car designed to get more fuel economy out of it, designed to help you operate it as a plug-in, believe it or not. You can do that with a Honda Insight. You have to be willing to hack the car a little bit, but it's possible. And now 
hopefully we can use that resource and that wealth of information to get this car back on the road as an electric car, but only using salvage components and like for like replacement parts for things like the interior and the carpet if we need to replace those. The seat belts are going to need to be replaced. We may have to replace the seat rails. So obviously we're going to have to use original or pattern parts for that. But for the rest of it, we're going to try and use salvage components wherever possible, or maybe 3D printed parts if we need to. So that's it for today's video. I know it's very different to what we normally do on the channel, but I figured that it was about time to show you what we're going to do with the car, show you around the car, show you how it looked after I got all of the things that were inside out, after I took the wheel spats off and had a little bit of an inspection, I'm sure we'll find lots of other things to do. Um, I hate doing brakes. So if there's anybody locally who wants to help me with the brakes, let me know. I'm fine doing anything that makes a car go and turn, but I, I have a bit of history with brakes. I don't trust them, I don't like them. Don't even go there. Thanks to the amazing people who are scrolling by on my right, they are our 15 to 49 dollar a month patreon supporters you are amazing i've got the list here because i always forget what i'm doing outside special thanks to john lyons ray Jean fellows jeffrey songster and tesla in the gong they are our 50 dollar a month patrons and oh my goodness i am so grateful for our 100 dollar patreon supporters that is marcel ward reggie watts jp fagerback sean ueda ian and Will Graylin. You guys are, I'm just blown away by the support that you guys offer. It, thank you. I'm blown away by all of your support. And if you want to become a Patreon supporter, whether it is from $1 a month to $100 or more a month, you'll find links below on how to do that. You'll also find links to our free Discord server. You'll also find a link of uh, how to get money to us through Patreon, Bitcoin, and Ko-fi, all of those three things. Also, you'll find a link to our swag store. It is nearly the holidays. It is a great time to get your swag. I am not wearing any Transport Evolved swag today. I've owned this t-shirt or this hoodie for a really long time, and I've only just plucked up the courage to wear it. I know it will be controversial. Some people will like it, some people will not. This is not by Transport Evolved. I can't remember who I got it from, but I found it last year and I bought it for Christmas as a bonus for another hoodie that I bought somebody that I uh, wanted to gift a hoodie to and this one cost a little bit extra so I bought it for myself and I bring it out sometimes. I wore it fully charged live this year. Did you see me wearing it? Thanks for joining me. Don't forget, stay safe, wear a mask. And yes, if you're in America, please vote. Keep evolving. <laughs>